great pleasure on behalf of BT to welcome you all here to the BT Young Scientist um, and Technology Exhibition 2015. It's the 51st exhibition, and I think for anything to have, for someone to have conceived the idea in the first place is amazing, but for it still to be going 51 years hence really is quite incredible. I'd like to extend a particular welcome to, um, to Miriam um, and obviously to um, our speakers, Emer, Didier and, and Paul. Um, and, and Paul, I'm sure I'm like many people in the room um, who watched with, um, with, 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 um, with quite a lot of excitement the victory of the European Ryder Cup team. But I remember early in the coverage, I think it was the morning of the first day, and one of the commentators on the, um, on, on the um, channel that I was watching said, um, something about the look of the Irish. And it's a phrase that really irritates me because I don't think Irish people are lucky. When I see Irish people's success either in business, in entertainment or in sport, it's normally built on hard work and execution. And I think, Paul, you took a huge step forward for everyone's perception of Ireland in terms of that hard work and execution. And not only everybody else's perception of us, but I think our own perception of ourselves. And I'd like to thank you for that, Paul. What I thought I might talk to you about this morning, just very briefly, is, first of all, the exhibition that's taking place next door. You're, you're only literally one room away from it, um, and I'm hoping some of you might drift across there um, after you've um, attended the conference. Uh, give you a couple of parallels for, um, for today um, and, and how that fits into BT's um, business. And then finally, I'm going to have a request for you at the end as well. So if I, forget to, if I forget the request, don't let me leave the stage, Miriam, without asking them to do one thing for me. Um, in terms of the exhibition, um, we had um, 2,077 entries this year from over 4,500 students. So it was the biggest entry we've ever had. We whittled that down to 550 um, exhibitors who are exhibiting here today. Judging started yesterday afternoon, and the exhibition opens to the public this morning, and the, exhibition, and the judging will continue through today and tomorrow, and then on Friday afternoon we will announce the winner of the BT Young Scientist and Technology Exhibition. Judging is a detailed process. Every project is judged at least three times from a team of over 82 judges. And these judges are um, experts in the world of science and technology. It's not a, it's not a set of BT judges. They, these are experts in their, in their fields. It's been a phenomenally successful exhibition, and not just successful here locally. And Miriam referred to the three girls who went on to win the Google Science Fair and were named as one of the top 25 most influential teens by Time magazine, which is quite an achievement. But over many years, the winners of this exhibition have gone on to compete in the European Young Scientist and have come in first place no less than 14 times in its 26-year history. So it's high quality and highly successful, and not just on scientific side, but also from a business perspective. You're going to hear from Emer today, who set up a business out of a project that they submitted to the BT Young Scientist, and many of you will also know the Collison Brothers. So it's an exhibition that has driven huge success for Irish people. Why do we do it? Why does BT do it? And it's a question I get asked quite often, and I've had to think long and hard about why that is, because it is a very um, significant venture for us as an organization. But we do it for two reasons. First and foremost, we do believe as a company in putting back in to the societies in which we operate. And what better way to put back into the society that you operate in than developing young talent? Ireland's greatest asset is our people, and developing them at this, at this early age is a, is a great contribution for BT to be able to make. But there are also selfish reasons. Our staff organize this exhibition. We don't write a check and outsource it. Our staff, and you'll see some of them at the back of the room wearing their red coats, and when you see red coats around the exhibition area, they're all BT people. They're by day project managers, IT specialists, network engineers. For one week they become the organizers of an exhibition, and they really enjoy doing it. They feel a sense of purpose, and for people who are our customers, those same people are working in your businesses um, right throughout the year with that same sense of, sense of purpose and commitment. And we think that defines us as a company and something that we're enormously proud of. In terms of what it takes to put it on, it's not just BT. 
We require the teachers, we require the students to participate, we need the judges to do the judging. All is done free of charge. Um, we have a huge network of partners that we've built, over 60 partners. Um, our lead partners are Analog Devices, Intel, Perigo and RTE. And they make a huge contribution, both in terms of financial contribution and in terms of their presence here at the exhibition. And they have their stands that um, keep the young people entertained. So it is a huge collaboration, a collaborative event around innovation. Which leads me to today and, and the theme of today, which is innovation with global connections. I'm, I'm a firm believer that in business today, you cannot survive if you're not innovating and you're not collaborating. No one company has the answer to all the problems that you have anymore. You need to be able to innovate and you need to be able to collaborate. There is no one knows this better than BT. You've seen from the video, we have a 168 year history. The majority of that history, we were selling telephone calls. There may be some of you in this room old enough to remember when you were able to sell telephone calls. But that business has utterly transformed, and we've had to transform our business into a global technology and entertainment company. And we've done that through innovation with over 10,000 research and development scientists and through collaboration, through understanding that we don't have all the answers. We need to work with people to get them. So that's it from me in terms of the exhibition that's going on and the, um, the context for, for today. My one request of you is, we, we reckon there's about 200 people in the audience. Um, and we would like you all to go next door and visit the exhibition when you're finished. There's two reasons why you might want to do this. Reason number one is because it will make your day. In, in fact, I would, I would wager it will make your week. I have yet to see somebody who's walked through that exhibition and not come out feeling two times more optimistic and in a better mood than they were when they walked in. So if from purely selfish reasons, I would urge you to go in and make your day. If you're not in the business of making your day and you still think you're too busy, there's 550 people in there. If everybody in this room goes in and sees three projects, just ask them about their project and tell them what a great job they've done and how proud you are of the work that they've done. If we all do that, every single person in that room is likely to have been told that they've done a good job. And when you see the looks on their faces and the boost of enthusiasm that that will give them, I guarantee you that will make your day. So that's my request, and I'll now hand you back to Miriam. Thank you very much. She was one of the winners in 2009 at the exhibition, but she's here today as the CTO of her own company, and she's going to tell us all about it. Emer, thanks so much for being here today. No First of all, tell me about your transition from the exhibition to running your own company. Yeah, well, I think the transition kind of started on the Saturday. So we were announced as runners-up on the Friday night, uh, and after about 12 hours of getting over the shock, we were at the back wall, and we started to be inundated with public... Um, kind of responses and comments um, and people coming up to us who either had tinnitus themselves because um, our project was all about ringing in the ears and trying to find some kind of solution for that um, or family members, close friends had the problem. It seemed that every single person who spoke to us that day, of which there were hundreds, was affected by this problem. Um, so at that point it started to become very real that the the problem that we had solved or come up with some solution for really was a meaningful one and sort of one that was having a very negative impact on, on lots of people's lives. Um, so at that point we decided initially that we would look at doing further research, um, but we kind of fell into the funding chasm between secondary school and university. So uh, it was on approaching the county enterprise board, which are now the local enterprise offices, that they suggested, well, you have something here that is already developed and tested, um, how about you kind of come up with some way of commercialising that, which will then go on to fund future research. Um, and that's exactly what we did. So over the summer then of 2009, after getting the Leaving Cert out of the way, um, we <laughs> designed the website, launched it, um, did all the kind of, you know, the nitty gritty of insurance and actually starting up a company and um, kind of the more fun stuff of PR and getting involved with customers and finding out what they were... Uh, what they were thinking and what they needed from, from a product, um, and then launched in August 2009. 
So we've been continually selling some version of tinnitus therapy since then, but we've actually gone on and have used money that we've raised from, uh, from the business to do further research, um, culminating in a clinical trial last year at the University of Edinburgh on a product for people who suffer from tinnitus full-time. Uh, so they chronically have a, a ringing in their ears or a buzzing sound that's always annoying them, always at them. Um, and, and we've actually clinically proven an effective therapy for them now as well. So that's what's currently on the market. How big a global problem is it? And when you set out to do this um, project, did you know it could transfer itself into a very successful company? Not initially, no. Um, it actually started as a personal problem. Both Rona and I, from going to gigs, and I used to play the drums, we had ringing in our ears. Um, and you know, before we started looking into the science behind it, we didn't know what was causing it. Uh, and more particularly, we didn't know why there were any good solutions out there that were accessible. Um, all the existing solutions were either based in clinics, so very expensive, both financially and kind of geographically quite difficult to access, um, or there was just no science behind them at all. And obviously, being young scientists, we wanted to kind of figure out why we should trust a product. Um, so it was kind of starting looking into it from a personal perspective, but it was really the young scientist and kind of that, uh, the first sort of public unveiling and that per public reaction. Um, that indicated the impact. So we now know there's over 300 million people worldwide who suffer from tinnitus, wow. um, and a further 300 million people, well, with some overlap, who suffer from uh, hearing loss. So it is really a massive global issue now. To what extent do you harness the power of digital, and even talk now of digital health? How significant and important is that in your business? It's incredibly important. So we were... We, well, we started a little over five years ago now. We would have been kind of... We initially just defaulted to selling online. That's how we thought it should be done. But we've now seen more and more of our competitors come online and try and build up their online presence. Um, but having sort of that digital presence from the very beginning and ultimately designing a product that's globally accessible from the very beginning has been a big advantage to us. Um, we see digital health as the next big revolution in healthcare. Um, so everything from you know heartbeat monitoring mm. um, to actually delivering therapy, like our therapy now, you can get on any internet-enabled smartphone. Um, so you can do it almost anywhere. Um, but more importantly, you can do it relatively inexpensively and you can do it globally. So being automatically digital gives us that global reach from day one, essentially. And as Colin said earlier, it's not just, and it's not perhaps at all about the luck of the Irish, it's about hard work. How hard have you worked to get this successful? And secondly, do you have aspirations for global success for your business? Yeah, so we've been going about five and a half years now, mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely been hard work. Um, it's been very enjoyable hard work, but no doubt hard work. Mm -hmm. um, so both Rona and I continued and went on to university after launching the business. Um, so for a long while we were studying and doing this at the mm -hmm. same time. Um, finally finished with that now, <laughs> thank God. Um, so now we are focusing kind of full-time on the business, which is great. Um, and increasingly we're starting to find people who are passionate, as passionate as us about our idea. Um, so we now have a team of five, which is, is really cool. Um, but certainly that digital aspect gives us the key, I think, to the, the global market. Um, we already have a range of customers from everywhere from like the west coast of the US to um, Pakistan. We had a series of being very popular in Malta. Mm. No one knows why. <laughs> um, um, you know, remote parts of Australia. Um, and we get emails from these people all the time, uh, often at weird times of night. Um, <laughs> but the, it, the global marketplace is, is the only one to be a part of, in our opinion, now. Um, we're tackling a massive global problem, and there's no reason that anyone shouldn't have access. One mm. of the big problems, actually, with hearing, generally, is that only 11% of hearing problems occur in what we'd call third world or kind of um, economically successful companies. And for the other 90-odd percent, there's very, very little access to hearing treatments or mm. hearing aids, um, largely because of the cost, and that's mm. not because they can't be made cheaply. Mm. Um, part of it's access, um, but uh, our hope is that increasingly um, mobile technology and mobile distribution and internet distribution 
um, will help increase access to those sort of broader global markets. Final question. I know you've spoken about restored hearing being about communication and connecting. Explain that to me. What is that about? Yeah, so that's a very kind of fundamental cornerstone of what we do. Um, anyone with a hearing impairment, be it tinnitus or hearing loss or, or anything mm. else, their ability to communicate or to perceive communications is inhibited in some way. And that's really, really terrible for the, the individual, for their family and friends around them. Um, it can often make the workplace really difficult. So what we design all of our products around is that ability to communicate, um, either improving it um, or what we're doing with our new product, we're launching a new type of hearing protection called Sound Bounce. And basically all existing headsets that are inexpensive at the moment block out all sound. So you just can't communicate if you're wearing your hearing protection. But you might be working on a building site or in a noisy factory, you need to be wearing your hearing protection. If you were wearing really expensive electronic headsets, you can communicate but they're maybe 300 euro a pair, so it doesn't make any sense for an employer to provide these on a, on a mass scale. So what we've done is we've taken the power of these responsive systems, which allow this communication or conversation and the protection, but we've done it with smart materials using physics and kind of material science, stuff that kind of started out here in some yeah. shape or form, um, and put this into a new type of headset. So uh, they're retrofit inserts, and they're going to be launching in the next few months. But uh, the response from companies internationally already has been really great. So we're, we're hoping that that's going to be a real game-changing product in bringing communication in the workplace and protection to everyone, hopefully. Final question, do you still go to gigs and play the drums? <laughs> um, I now live in an apartment rather than out in my parents' house in the country, so oh, okay. I can't play my drums. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, we do. But again, we've seen the effect of noise yeah. damage in, a, in the longer term and how debilitating it can be for a person. Um, so I usually bring, mm -hmm. bring some earplugs with me. Uh, it can be done safely, <laughs> just, just wear your hearing protection. <laughs> well, I, love, I know everybody here is so delighted for your success. You're so young to be so successful. Ladies and gentlemen, Ema, fantastic. <laughs>